All right, it's crime time here on Court TV Live. Let's introduce tonight's law enforcement professionals. Joining us, retired Los Angeles Police Department Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Sergeant Dorsey started with the LAPD in 1980. She worked in patrol and specialized units, including gangs, and she is the author of Black and Blue, the creation of a social advocate. Also with us tonight, retired police officer Vince Champion. Vince served as a police officer for over two decades. He handled homicide reconstruction and trained fellow police officers as a firearm instructor. He is currently a police union representative. Great to have you both back on the program. Our, our first story tonight, we've got some video from the Stanislaus County Sheriff. You've got a man in a bobcat tractor who's driving at some deputies. On Sunday, November 8th, we had a critical incident near the town of Denair that ended with a deputy-involved shooting. It began in the afternoon when we received a call of an elderly man acting erratically. There was no crime reported, so our deputies cleared the call and left the scene. Less than an hour later, at about 5.40 p.m., deputies were again dispatched to the rural home, but this time it was reported that Mr. Yang was acting violently. Ultimately, he drove the bobcat at both a passing motorist and one of our own deputies in his patrol vehicle on Grattan Road, which resulted in the deputy-involved shooting. He's going out there as a civilian. Take off your seatbelt. Seat 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 right? No. Well, he can go. Uh, uh, I'm so happy I'm gonna die. Well, I'm so happy. No. Go back. No, I got a bleeding. I know. Sir, if you get out. How can I get out? Take it How off. How can I get out? Son of, son of a bitch, kill me. No. Right. Keep How your hands on the it up. How do I lift this up off of you? Before we turn it on. Oh, oh, I see. Difficult situation, but how did the deputies handle it? Uh, let's bring in uh, Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey and Vince Champion. All right, Sergeant Dorsey, uh, how did the deputies handle this one? Well, listen, we know that they were there early, and so the question for me that begs to be answered is, did they ask the proper questions? If he was acting erratic during the first call for service, I wonder if he was saying the kill me stuff, um, I want to die, I'm so happy I'm going to die during that first encounter, and if so, why didn't they take a different tactic uh, in dealing with him? And then in the second response later that evening when it's dark, I'm wondering, why did the officers try to drive past that bobcat and put themselves within close proximity? So um, clearly this man is troubled. There seemed to be a, a suicide by cop desire. And I, I would have given him a wider berth to see if there wouldn't have been a better way to resolve it rather than shoot him. Thankfully, he didn't die, but I'm not sure that these tactics were the best. <laughs> Vince, uh, your thoughts about how this was handled by the deputies? Well, again, as the sergeant mentioned, it would be nice to know what the beginning story was. But what I got out of that, the officer that put himself so supposedly in danger, it appeared that he was trying whatever that other vehicle was, if that was a uh, civilian, that he was trying to warn the civilian to get them out of there before, as you could see, that bobcat had a big metal pole or, or I guess it's like a um, forklift on the front, which really would did some damage, he could have hurt somebody. Um, and I think that's why he put him in his, himself in danger. But at that point, you know, we have to make a judgment and we use deadly force based on protecting ourselves and other people. And it appears that they had finally got to the point to where they felt that this gentleman was gonna hurt either themselves or other citizens and they needed to get to it as a stop. I mean, 
that's a big metal uh, tractor walking around there that it's kind of hard to stop it unless you can, you know, somehow or another get that motor turned off. Next story comes to us from WCPO in Cincinnati, a racist threatening letter sent to a family. When Mia Harlan's husband opened a letter late last week. The way he responded, the way he acted, told me something wasn't, it wasn't right. That's because this is the letter the Harlan's say came in the mail. We've covered up racial slurs and derogatory language. Part of the letter reads, get the signs down or vandalism is on its way. And if you don't take that expletive down in a hurry, we'll be aiming at your house, your cars, and you. And I was very disgusted. I was very upset, angry. Um, offended. The Harlands have a Black Lives Matter flag and campaign signs for President-elect Joe Biden in their yard. They reported the letter to Westchester police and the township says this is being taken seriously and is under investigation. Stay away from my family. Stay away from my property. What else would they do? Will they actually come to our home and try to harm us or try to harm our children, our grandchildren? The Harlands say they are taking extra precautions to stay safe and, if anything, they're only going to put up more signs, hopefully educating neighbors and their community and promoting equality and understanding. My message for them is if you don't understand what you see when, uh, when this sign here is saying Black Lives Matter, if you don't understand the message here, then this is absolutely the thing that needs to be here. So how seriously should people take threats like these? What should they do to keep themselves safe? Uh, Vince Champion, I'll start with you. Uh, very seriously. I mean, this isn't a letter that just said, we don't like the signs you have. Um, you know, they physically threatened them. They threatened to do harm in a vandalism, but also harm to their family. I mean, the police department should also take this very seriously. Uh, they should have special, you know, extra patrol on that home. Uh, any noise or anything that comes from that family that they should definitely respond and they need to be canvassing the area because with those type of uh, threats and that letter as it exists, you know, that could be very some someone very close to that family. Sergeant Dorsey, what are your concerns here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, an extra patrol from uh, the local police department would be helpful. And I, I hope this family has the wherewithal to maybe put up some surveillance cameras so they can see if someone should um, trespass on their property. But, you know, the problem, Vinny, is that we have a president in Trump who encourages, incites, and does not speak out to discourage wackadoodles like the person that sent this letter from this, si this type of violence. We've got Folks who want to kidnap and try a governor in Michigan, a young 20-year-old in Atlanta is now being threatened because he was doing his job. And this president has done nothing to dissuade, but everything to encourage. And so I hope this family gets the protection that they need from local authorities. All right, coming up, more crime time, plus this. There will be a forever ache in my heart and she will be never forgotten. That's a heartbroken mom in another one of the stories we're talking about tonight in our Crime Time segment. Still with us, Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, retired from the LAPD, and Vince Champion, police union rep, retired police officer. Uh, this story comes to us from Houston, Texas, an Instagram influencer found dead. The strange disappearance of a social media influencer ends with a disturbing, deadly discovery. Detectives in Houston are still piecing together what happened to 26-year-old Alexis Robinault, also known as Alexis Sharkey, to her tens of thousands of Instagram followers. On Saturday morning, a government employee spotted Sharkey's body by the road in an industrial area of West Houston near Interstate 10. The same day, her mother, Stacy Robinault, shared a post reporting the young woman missing. Well, what do I remember about that day, except for, you know, those things you regret, the thing of, oh, I haven't responded back about her coming to Christmas because we were talking on Wednesday. I, I got to get back with her and get that finalized. And I was 
We were just settling in after decorating for Christmas and then we got the horrible call that she was missing. According to Houston police detectives, Alexis was wearing no clothing and showed no signs of visible wounds. How she died is still under investigation. I don't understand. I am 100% confident that this is something that my child did not do to herself. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know what I don't even know. I can't comprehend how she got where she was in the manner she was. Shocked family and friends have taken to social media to express their grief over the sudden loss of a woman who freely shared her love of travel, self-care and fashion with the world through her Instagram account. And you're supporting people instead of large middleman chains. She was incredibly intelligent. Um, she graduated summa cum laude from college in a biology degree. She, um, she is very analytical and logical, a loving human being that just lit up everywhere. Online, she often featured her husband, Tom Sharkey, seen here in a travel video on her YouTube page last year at a Colorado National Monument. The pair posed together in this Halloween costume photo five weeks ago. Friends of the couple say Alexis was seeking a divorce. All right, how would you conduct this investigation? You've got an Instagram influencer, tens of thousands of followers, very public person. She's found naked on the side of the road two miles from her home. She's uh, about to seek a divorce from her husband. Uh, Sergeant Dorsey, how would you investigate this one? Well, you certainly want to take a look at, um, you know, her social media contacts and make sure that there isn't someone who may have fixated on her. But the fact that she's in the midst of a divorce and that uh, she was just out partying uh, at a Halloween event with her husband five weeks ago and now she's missing and was discarded in the manner that she was makes me think that maybe that's the first place they're going to start is with the ex-husband. And it seems like mom is kind of cautious and careful in the way that she speaks about, I don't know and I don't want to speculate because she doesn't want to mess up whatever investigation is going on with the uh, local officers. Vince, how would you investigate this one? Yeah, I mean, always the, the ex-husband is definitely going to be the first one you want to go and get all the information you can from there. But... She is on Instagram. She is on social media a lot. Uh, you know, our officers now that are doing all the... Uh, forensic, forensics on the computers are doing great jobs. So I'm sure they're going through those also to see if there is, as a sergeant said, somebody fixated on her. Somebody, you know, they may have just mentioned a word or, or one sentence that may lead the investigation into a whole different area. But I would definitely, uh, the ex-husband, they're always going to be first, whether we like that idea or not. But second, I would definitely have my forensics people going through that computer on a real regular hard basis. All right. This is a story we're going to continue to follow here uh, on Court TV. Uh, next story comes to us from a WEWS in Cleveland. A family searches for the body of their missing son. Officially, Akron police say the disappearance of Iron Cannon is a missing person investigation. But tonight, Cannon's family says they're convinced he's dead. The big question now, where's his body? The picture on C.J. Elkins' chest says it all. It was always me and Iron, C.J. and Iron. Anybody that knows us knows it's always both of us. It's why the last five weeks have been so hard on Elkins. The disappearance of his brother, Iron Cannon, like a piece of Elkins stolen away. It's like just waking up to a, a nightmare. It's like at times I don't even want to wake up. It's better just sleeping when I can because when I'm asleep, he, he's still here. Elkins says his brother was last heard from October 18th, telling his nephew he was on his way home. He never made it. His family says leads they've received convinced them Cannon is dead. We know that we're looking for his body. It's not a matter of him hiding out somewhere or somebody holding him like he's gone. We know that for sure, 100% for sure. But where is he? Days of searching, even digging, failed to find the 27-year-old leaving his family stuck wondering. Our brother's gone. How are we supposed to feel? How are we supposed to move on? 
No answers, no justice, no nothing. It's not fair, it's not right. Worse, they believe someone out there has the answers they desperately seek. It's like waking up every day and everywhere that you go, anywhere that you at, like looking up, looking around and seeing like, is this somewhere that somebody could have hit them or could have put them? Is, is nerve wracking. Their hope, someone will come forward with a tip police need to find Cannon, to bring them answers, to bring this family justice. All I want is him. His body, we could put the rest the proper way and move forward. When it comes to him, like, I'm going to go 100%. I don't care about sleep, eating, no nothing. Only thing that my focus is is finding him and locating him. Anyone with information about this case is asked to call either Akron Police or Wadsworth Police. Both departments tonight trying to answer the question, where is Iron Cannon? So when does a missing persons case become a homicide case? Uh, Vince, what type of information do you need to take it to that next level when someone is missing? You, you actually, you need a, you need either their witness or someone to see exactly where this could have happened. A body, of course, would always be that, uh, the one thing that you want to look at. But when you have a missing person case, you know, the majority of the officers that I worked with, unless we could just confirm 100% that they had just left, we, we always kind of treated it a little more than just a missing person. And, and I could say one thing, and, and a lot of these cases that we've looked at, even tonight, the family is the best source of information, especially if you have a brother like that that is determined that he's going to find his brother. So as an officer, you need to keep up with the family on a regular basis. The smallest thing while they're looking around, they may see, may send you that way. Um, we always call them missing persons, but until they're found, um, they may not be upgraded officially, but a lot of the officers that work the missing person crime unit, they treat it a little more than just a missing person. And to stay on top of the family and talk to them on a regular basis is probably the best way they're going to get the best information, where to go to next, who to talk to next, and canvas the neighborhood again. Sergeant Dorsey? Yeah, listen, I mean, we just I had an incident where there was a young woman who was missing, and within a few hours of her mom contacting authorities, they immediately began a very high-profile investigation, and we know that it ended in a murder. We have a black man who's missing, and I don't know if the family is not articulating why they believe he's dead, but we must admit and acknowledge that there is a disparity sometimes in investigations when you have a missing black person, man or female, versus a missing white person, male or female. And so um, I think that they should take the family at their word and that they should not call this a missing and should give this case the same attention to detail that was given to the other. And I get that these are two different jurisdictions, but this is not the first time where we've seen this kind of disparity when it's a missing black person. Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, Vince Champion, always great to have you on the program. Thanks so much. Please come back soon.